Thank you, Carol. Thank you to the archives and to the staff at Old Alabama Town and Landmarks. This is a great tradition uh, to have a decorative arts symposium in our state. We like the state of Alabama. Our symposium is young. And when we compare ourselves to our neighboring states of Mississippi and Georgia, we see that Alabama is not as old as the state of Georgia. It is a year or two younger than the state of Mississippi. But Alabama is rich in history, and it's rich in its resources. And for me and for many of you, we see that we are rich because of our people. And a study of objects really is a study of people. It's hard to separate art history from history. And to appreciate art history, one needs to look at history and look at people. And so the program today, when we focus on this emerging state, we see that we are looking at names as well as the names of objects. And it's an interesting group of people. I wonder if the paths of the borders and Madame Levert and Horace King crossed. I like to think that they did, but I doubt it. And here they are, almost 200 years later, on the program together. And I think that says something about this state, and not only this emergence from 1819 to 1860, but an emergence of 200 years of statehood that Alabama has emerged and it has come a very long way. When we study the history of the state, we go back to prehistoric times and we look at indigenous peoples. And when Carol and Joey and I were talking about this program, I didn't feel that we could leave out native people or native culture because that's so important to the state of Alabama and to who we are. And one way of appreciating um, the native culture of this state and neighboring states is to look at the handicraft of basket work. And when we look around at collections of baskets, we see that it is the Lauren Rogers Museum that has a great collection and they have a great staff. And we see today that one reason for that is the enthusiasm of a native Mississippian, Tommy Rogers. She is going to speak to us about native hands and a review of the baskets in the great museum in Laurel, Mississippi, the Lauren Rogers. Will you join me as we welcome Tommy? All right. Thank you so much for coming, and I'm so glad that I was invited to participate today. Um, we don't do many um, programs specifically on decorative arts these days and historical objects. Um, I think I'm one of the lucky ones because I get to speak to you about objects. I have things to show and things to share. Uh, and I'm a visual person. I have a painting degree from the University of Southern Mississippi and started working at the Lauren Rogers Museum in 1990. I was a baby and just out of college. Um, I started working in the library. And within a year, uh, the registrar decided she was really ready to retire after being there for 30 plus years. And um, it just worked out 
great. Um, I was so excited to get to touch objects, to be with them, to exhibit them. Um, so I'm coming up on 30 years this year at the museum, and the baskets have been my baby for a long time, although that was the one collection I knew absolutely nothing about when I started. Uh, so it's been a growing process. How many of you have ever been to the Lauren Rogers Museum? Okay. And we are located in Laurel, Mississippi. We are on Interstate 59 between Birmingham and New Orleans. And it's a town of about 18,000 people, a county of about 60,000 people. We have a full-time staff of seven right now. Uh, went from 10 to 7, and, and probably as a lot of other places are doing as people retire or leave, some positions aren't being filled. So we do feel that um, that little crunch of staff and bodies on the premises too. But we have fabulous collections and I'm going to just jump on a little bit. Um, so this is what you see when you drive down Fifth Avenue, the Lauren Rogers Museum of Art. Uh, the museum was built, opened in 1923 as a memorial to Lauren Rogers. Everybody wanted to know or wants to know who is he? Who was he? Was he an artist? Was he famous for this or that? Well, Laurel was built as a lumber town, and his family came to Laurel from Clinton, Iowa, because they were in the lumber business and had clear-cut their area and needed more timber. So we were home to Virgin Pine Forest. Um, it was Laurel was basically a little shanty town with just you know a few people living there. Uh, the railroads came through in 1860, and uh, so that was in place. So when they came in about 1890, it looked fruitful for them because they already had a money base to put in and start a business there. But this family was the reason we exist. Lauren's father and his grandfather saw this town as something that um, they didn't want to clear cut and leave. They wanted to clear cut, I say clear cut, but they wanted to build their homes and their families, bring them in and make Laurel their permanent residence. So we are the crown jewel of the town. We have five major collecting areas, around 2,000 objects, which doesn't sound like a lot, but we have, I would say, a good third of our collection, if not more, on display. The first official gift to the museum was the Native American baskets in 1923, and I'll tell you a little bit more about them in just a minute. We have American and European paintings, Japanese ukiyo-e woodblock prints, about 160 of those, and we have about 100 um, British Georgian silver pieces that came to the museum uh, in the late 70s by a couple in Laurel. In fact, that's the only collection that was not started by one of the founding family members. So it is a beautiful building. We've added on uh, in 2013, we added contemporary gallery space because the problem became we didn't have public lecture and program space. So we were able to add uh, square footage in, for that reason, as well as much, much, much needed storage space. Some of you may understand that you have to move 10 things to get to one and move those 10 things back. That's where we were. Um, so I have a fantastic storage space. Um, the baskets um, have been just, it's been a joy to get to know them. When I started in 1990, they were, there were typewritten labels as most museum installations were. There were, mm, I don't remember the number, but an easy 300 on display, a lot. The room was tight, the room, the color was, it just did not enhance the baskets. There were a lot of negatives and they needed an update. The information was dated. Um, but of course, there's, you know, there was a changing tide in how you interpret Native American culture. The voice of the Native American uh, was becoming very important and had been left out over the years. The uh, collector had worked very closely, you know, gathering information from, from dealers who she had bought things from, and, and they could have been, a lot were representatives with the with Department of Interior uh, in the 20s, or well, really before then. She did most of her collecting between 1900 and 1904. Um, so there were there were lots of reasons for us to take a look and then we all looked at each other and said well none of us are experts in any of this stuff 
not in design, not in interpretation, not in Native American culture. We have a reservation, Choctaw Reservation, right outside of Laurel, about seven or eight miles from Laurel, with a very small group of weavers, uh, just a very small group in general. In Philadelphia, Mississippi, two hours north of us, is the large Choctaw Reservation, and we have certainly built a relationship with them over the years. They come in and do festivals with us. Um, so it's it's been a great way to grow that relationship, to get to know other weavers, to have them incorporated into our fourth grade tour program, which focuses specifically on Native American culture. Uh, but you're looking at the the entry to the current installation. We started in 1999 with a grant proposal to the National Endowment for the Humanities, crossed our fingers, and that jump-started us what we needed to do to begin research. We were able to do a number of travels with that grant and go to Phoenix and Denver and um, Victoria and Vancouver, um, and there were there are other museum people we talked to, and if you don't know the phrase NAGPRA, we get we got to see NAGPRA in process, and that is the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. I'm going to throw it in there just because it it's always in the back of my mind to know what we need to do, but it meant that we needed to report our holdings to Native American tribes. We did not and do not have human remains, and that's what drives the law. But we have other things that could be questionable. Um, there were, the law refers to sacred objects, objects of cultural patrimony, funerary objects. So we, as, as I found out, lots of other museum professionals were very in the dark about what this meant for us. The law felt open-ended, and what was our responsibility. So we reported everything. Um, but others in the, especially the Pacific Northwest, they repatriate all the time. There are things that, if, even though our collector bought these things, um, and sometimes we have receipts showing uh, what she bought, but that doesn't matter. If a tribe does not know how to make an object and they want to reintroduce it into their culture, then they have every right to ask that it be returned. To reintroduce that, to teach weavers or potters or whoever the, the object is, and, and craftspeople need to know. Because, yes, these things are dying arts, and even though there have been resurgences in education for a lot of them, I see a dip. I see a dip with weavers and, and some who have passed away, and sometimes there are people who help them, marketers who help them or who have helped them. And uh, one very special person who was a great friend to the Choctaw weavers passed away two or three years ago. And, um, and I thought, there will never be anybody who helps promote their work like she did. So therefore, will they push the envelope on quality? Will they push the envelope on, on keeping those traditions alive? And we, we hope so. We hope they will find that person and that voice again. So what you see at the very beginning of this exhibition, um, Choctaw, a Choctaw case front and center, and the fish trap that hangs above that. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. It's not a large space. And these were two rooms that had been opened into one. Uh, we, we wanted something very clean. We wanted something that would highlight the objects and not interfere with them. So you see all these wonderful glass cases. And what you don't see in this picture are the labels. They are there, but they're printed on plexiglass. And for people, because we didn't want them to interfere and have all these cards all over the place. So the label text is also printed in a, in a book in, the, in that room, and any visitor can take that and walk through with them. We have three levels of interpretation. So there is the label that has the basic tombstone information. There is the wall panel beside it or near it. Um, there is a card rack or rack card, basically, that... Uh, accompanies each case. So we have Southeast Choctaw and Eastern Woodlands here in this front area that you're looking at. And then there is also the publication. I'm going to 
pass this around in a minute, but you can just flip through. And I brought four copies of this. If you are so fascinated by Native American history and objects, please look at the desk, the table out front, and take one for your own. There are two hard copies and two soft copies that I brought. But uh, we worked with three curators for this installation and the publication. Uh, and then there's also a history about the collector in the front. But I'm just going to pass this around. We have learned if you can't do anything else, a publication will sell your collection to the public and will, um, and will make them overjoyed at, at what is actually there and it's something tangible that they can walk away with, something besides a rack card or a brochure. Um, so we are, we're thrilled to be able to have that and that was printed in 2005. We opened this exhibition, um, we thought, about a few weeks after Katrina, that's when it was going to happen. So we, we just pushed it by a couple of months. Um, another view as you're looking into the European gallery actually behind the exhibition. They are divided by regions of the country and because we can look at paintings in one way and think of paintings in a thematic approach or a chronological approach. We really couldn't do that with the baskets. We're, we don't know the dates on a lot of them, or there is a 20, 30, 50 year date range sometimes uh, with the baskets, and they can age depending on how well they're taken care of. Sometimes many of these have been behind cases away from the elements and away from a lot of lights since 1900. And that's pretty amazing to think these are probably the most preserved large group of baskets, certainly in the southeast. The back wall that you see here also mirrors the divided sections. So on that far side, you're looking at south, more southeastern baskets. Um, the middle is southwest. And then the opposite end on the next one, you're looking at uh, the northwest area. So while I'm not covering information on those today, it's still important to know that they're there. In fact, those are probably, Southwest is probably our biggest group of baskets. Now, here is the lady of the hour for us. This is Catherine Marshall Gardner. She was Lauren Rogers' great aunt. So back to the story of Lauren Rogers, who was he and what did he do? He died at the age of 23 in 1921. He was a son, only son, of his parents and his grandparents, only grandson. They were building a home for he and his new bride on that site. And they had been married for nine months when he passed away with complications of appendicitis. He was the golden boy, or he was going to be their golden boy for the timber industry, for their company, the Eastman Gardner Lumber Company. Uh, they expected great things out of Lauren. They had already built homes and churches, and um, they helped bring in a middle class to this little town. There were, there were just great things that the family did. They were humanitarians, probably first, as well as great business people. But Lauren broke their heart when he passed away, and there was nobody to leave you know, everything too. So they had paintings in their collections and in two years, this is amazing to me, within two years of his death, they had the front of the museum built, the library, which is an English style library when you walk in, and uh, the hallway leading to the new galleries they were going to build. In 1926, all of our permanent collection galleries were built. So Laurel is, just has an intriguing story, it has an intriguing history. Because we all say, what if, what if, what if, what if Lauren had lived? What would have happened? There were no heirs. There are some distant cousins and relatives. His widow went on to remarry later, and she served on the museum for a number of years, and she had children by her second husband. And they had been active um, for a number of years also on the board. The house still stands, that is her home, and it is now St. John's Day School and has been this school for a long time, probably most of my lifetime, um, and it's right down the street from the museum. The other family members who helped in the, the, um, in the uh, 
mill, the, the biz, business. Those houses are built also along the street. And the childhood home of Lauren Rogers is directly across the street from the museum. And the another family, a distant family, lived there. And when they passed away, they left it to the museum. And we have office space upstairs, and we rent out the downstairs area. So when you come to Laurel, there are so many connections when you drive in that historic area. Um, but that's a very important, both of these are very important to our history. Um, but this house is maintained, and um, it's actually that sun porch area is really where the... Um, the school cafeteria is and school offices so all the kids are in buildings in the back there it's amazing to see that house in early pictures because fifth avenue was a dirt road in the pictures and i just think that's kind of ironic and funny um, to think of such a grand house on this dirt street these are some photos miss gardner was a great record keeper um, she was she was a registrar before she knew what registrars were. Um, so these two pictures here show baskets in her home. Some of her her curiosity or inventory shots. I think more inventory shots. And there are a mixture of tribes in both of these pictures. In fact, most of these are probably uh, well, they are southwest and northwest materials. She took a series of photos like these on her front porch with a sheet behind them. How many times have we done that? Uh, <laughs> something, put a white background and take a picture. Most of these are actually, many of these are southeastern baskets here in this picture. And if you look at number five and number, um, where's the other, number 17, I believe is the other one. We don't have those in the collection. We didn't get those, and we don't know where they are. We don't know what she did with them. She was great at trading to other people for higher-quality baskets. Um, but, wow, number five, would I love to have that one in the collection. But, yeah, the others, the others are there, and you'll see those uh, in the gallery and in the catalog. Now, to think of tribes of the southeast, when you, when you look at southeastern materials, you know, we think, we think of Indian removal, and we think of what destroyed their growth and quality of craftsmanship more than Indian removal. The separation of tribes, uh, tribes leaving, going to Oklahoma. Disease, so many were killed and died just because of disease and the hardships that it took. How can you sit down and make something beautiful when you're struggling to, to, to feed your children? Uh, when you're on horseback, or probably not horseback, but walking. Um, and so, to me, what what a terrible rip of the heart in, in just their craftsmanship and what they can do. The Choctaw of Mississippi uh, are, are fairly prolific compared to uh, the other tribes, and I'm going to show you some other, um, some maps here in just in a minute. But the Choctaw, Cherokee, Creek, Seminole, and Chickasaw were considered five civilized tribes because of their advancements in language and, and learning Euro-American ways and, um, and, and their culture. But they don't exist in that way anymore. So we're thinking of, uh, this is a, a map, William Sturdivant, uh, 19, from 1967 from the Smithsonian. And I'm not sure how well you can see the word Choctaw in Alabama, Chickasaw, Cherokee, uh, Kwasati, or what we call Koshata, the Atacapa, the Chittimacha. So there are a number of these tribes, and, and the maps are fluid. I'm going to show you two other maps. And so every expert has a little different feel on how they think those tribes were and where they existed. And they were a little nomadic within their regions. They were having to hunt and fish and go as the, as the weather changed, as the rivers rose. Uh, they were, you know, hunting for deer, hunting or fishing. So this is a map from nativelanguages.org, and this is a little easier to read. And it is impossible for me to come to an Alabama Decorative Arts Symposium and not show the state of Alabama and, and how uh, experts feel about, about tribal placement here. So again, Kwasati is what I'm going to call Kushata later on in our, in our presentation. 
This is the map that's floating around in that catalog that's being passed around. This, uh, the letters in red, the words in red are showing the tribes that we have in our collection here. Now let's get to our pride and joy here. So these are two Choctaw baskets. The one on my left, your left, is a very old basket and it is, but it has a broad date range. It could be anywhere from 1830 to 1900. How broad is that? It is a double weave basket. So a double weave was special to southeastern tribes. The weaver would start on the inside bottom of the basket, weave up the side, and if you can see the edges, it's turned. There's no there's no finishing edge to it. It's turned and, and it comes down on the outside. You can't tell where, where the weaver starts or stops because the splints are trimmed on the bottom. Um, and even if you turn it over, you can't tell where it starts or stops. So it's, it's an interesting curiosity and, um, and a beautifully illustrated basket. But this is one of the oldest Choctaw baskets that we have. The one on the right is, was made by Francine Alex who just passed away within the last, I'm going to say, five years. And she was an exquisite basket weaver, one of the, I'm going to say, the best that's come along in modern times for as far as Choctaw materials. That pattern has been lost, we suspect. The, uh, a scrap was found in an old chicken house in Kemper County, Mississippi. Uh, the scrap, the fragment, was brought to the weaver and said, hey, what do you think about this? So she recreated what she felt this pattern really, what the basket or final product would have been had she ever seen one or had she ever known or been exposed to this pattern. Um, most of what you'll see in, in Native American basketry, they're like, American quilts. You see the same patterns over and over in traditional quilts because patterns are passed down from grandmother to daughter or daughter to or to granddaughter and those are kept very inwardly within the tribe and in our case with quilt making inwardly within families or, or quilting clubs still today. So this is a beautiful pattern. It's a double weave also and Francine was probably the only weaver of today's time that actually not only turns that lip but she turns it inward like the old basket and she has trained her daughter also in the same methods and her daughter is a beautiful weaver too. This piece is a fish trap and we cannot say 100% that it's Choctaw but nobody has been able to dispute it um, and we can't find anyone else who can make one a replica. I would love to have a replica on the walls instead of the real thing. So this is a basket inside of a basket and it's about five feet long, maybe a little longer. Uh, its dates are around 1880 to 1910 or its estimated dates and it is it's thought to be Choctaw because um, the comparison to Euro-American fish traps similar would be the end of it. The the, the pieces coming together and being tied off like they are. Uh, and you can see the inside basket on the right where there are spikes from the splints. So this is white oak. Now we know the traditional weaving is by women. This basket would have been made by a man. And when we lift it, lifted it to, to put it on display, you think about how heavy the splints are and the upper body strength that it takes just to cut them, to split them, um, the hard work that it takes. It is very much a man's world in dealing with, with oak or white oak, and I can definitely see that. But yes, women made and have made most of the other baskets, but we do have Choctaw males who come into the museum gift store and, and sell us baskets that they made. Now, the Choctaw make baskets mostly with swamp cane, and this is, um, this is an example of one. This is a laundry hamper, and it's a quite large one. Uh, swamp cane can be harvested any time of the year, but it is a dying plant as far as they're concerned. It's, they, they have secret patches of where they know swamp cane exists, and they don't tell you where it is. Even those of us who are museum people, and they know we're trying to promote who they are, what they do, we would love to have access sometimes just to be able to show school groups. They don't share. 
They do not tell us. Can you tell us, please? No. Um, they will bring some with them and demonstrate how to split it. But they take a knife from the top and run the knife all the way to the, to the bottom. It's not the same as bamboo. It kind of has that look. Um, but, but the knots are different, and it is it's hollow all the way down. Now, colors. I will say that this is, this is very modern because these colors, they turn to writ dye. It's, it was easier to deal with than having to go dig up roots and chew them and stain their teeth and, you know, just make a mess of their life. So, yeah, writ dye has been their friend for many years. But I've also read in recent years that because the dye is an inferior or becoming less saturated, they're having to dye multiple times to get it to whole color, and it's still not the quality that it was maybe in the 70s or 80s when they were learning to use the product. Uh, these two pictures show um, a variety of ages, and the one on the far left, no, I'm sorry, far right, I'm left-handed, so I'll, I'll mix them up all the time, but... I, that's the oldest one in the group, and it has had condition problems. Um, it's it's piece of um, the handle. Before it was put on display, the conservator had to repair it, but for the photograph, we had to hide its handle just to get the picture made. When you have a photographer coming from New Orleans who's spending several weeks with you, you don't have time to run to Nashville, get something fixed, and come back. So uh, we thought, we've got to have it in the image. But that is really more of a heart-shaped basket, and it's, it's, it's flatter. So once the handle was fixed and the curve was put back into it, um, the basket took on its natural shape and was not quite as bulbous as it shows in that picture. But again, you're probably looking at, you know, late 1800s for that, for that piece. Um, most of the others in that picture, or those two pictures, are probably from the 30s to the 50s with the front colored um, blue and, and red green basket, probably from the mid-80s. The top picture shows four. They're actually double-weave baskets in all their glory and splendor of color. Um, but when you look at those double-weaves and then look at the bottom picture, with these little bitty double weaves, and those are probably about that tall. You can see probably those are Francine Alex's pieces because of that little curved lip on there. But the big ones, I'm thinking, you know, everybody kind of has their specific style and how they handle things. So um, those, to me, they're, they're great. They're sturdy baskets, but they're really thick and heavy. The piece on the bottom left is going to be a Louisiana Choctaw piece, while the others are Mississippi Choctaw. And you'll see some of those illustrated also. The coloration, of course, is a, it's an older basket. And Louisiana has a, um, there's a yellow dye that they used in their early, early pieces. Now we turn to the Cherokee, who we are much more familiar with probably because they have quite a marketing tool at their disposal. The Cherokee, uh, we bought probably many of these baskets that you're about to see in 1981 when there was a traveling exhibition put on by the Koala Arts and Crafts Center. So it's a cooperative of, of native baskets where they're making and selling their baskets. So yes, very similar in style and color. Uh, swamp cane used in many. Uh, ash, I believe, are used in some. The dark brown color, I believe, comes from walnut. So they have a very different coloration. Um, but there's, if you'll notice, you can see a couple of these have, three of these are double weave with lids on them. So when you make a double weave basket and you're making the double weave lid to go over it, you got a few extra technical things thrown in, in the mix there for what you're trying to achieve and to work on. Eastern Cherokee, here are more of these. The bottom photo shows some made with honeysuckle. If you see the two in the, um, on the bottom left picture there, those are honeysuckle. Um, and then again, the variety of other woods in, in some of the others. But the technique is just absolutely beautiful. And they've done such a good job at teaching and relearning what was native to their to their culture. 
their number of trays. And again, I'm, I think we added probably about 50 baskets in that 1981 purchase. I'd have to go back and double check that. Now, Cushada, remember that word I said Quasati on the map? We call it Cushada now. These were also in that traveling exhibition. Uh, and so they're looking at pine needles, the use of pine needles in weaving. And we know there were plenty of Euro-American weavers working with pine needles. So how do you tell the difference? Um, I don't know that there is, there's a lot of those. Do you all have the equivalent? We have the Mississippi Craftsman's Guild. Do you have something similar in Alabama? No? Okay. So the Mississippi, you do? Okay. What is it called? Okay. But in Alabama, those style of baskets were taught through the home demonstration movement. Okay. Mm -hmm. In the early 20s. In the early 20s, okay. Um, so there's, you know, there are things, and there has to be a resurgence every so often, or we will lose them all. Um, and those programs that came along to help um, encourage people to grandmothers mostly to teach their granddaughters because a lot of times the daughters you know it's hard to learn something new once you're my age you know <laughs> or learn something that's that's nimble and you need nimble fingers for um, but not only are these people having to learn to weave they learn it from the bottom up we hope and that is from the gathering of materials so that's that's another whole area that you know how many young people really want to go out in swamps and on a cold, wet day and cut down swamp cane. I can't imagine going today, wading out in the swamp. <laughs> I think it would be terrible. Um, but the other baskets, the effigy baskets, are something that, that are charming, that, that their tribe, um, uh, they're good at. And if you take the lids off of these, they are pine needles, un I mean, they're yeah, pine needles underneath for the support. They're very sturdy baskets. Seminole, I, I brought this in, this is the only one we have, and the Seminole of Florida, are, they're very hard to find. We bought this one in about, well, the early 90s, and it was just one of those pieces. There was a collector, a dealer in New Orleans who had one, and, you know, I just told her to keep her eyes out for something, Seminole, something, just let me know. So this one came along, and it's beautiful. I don't ever see Seminole baskets. I still don't see them. I, I don't come across them. And I do look through various auction catalogs and, um, and try to keep my eyes out for them. So it's great to at least have one representation. Now, Miss Gardner, I'm going to step back. Miss Gardner, um, while her basket collecting was heavy, she gave about 500 baskets, Native American baskets, to the museum. You know, that's, that's a big number. But so many of those were from California and the Pacific Northwest. It was easy. They were plentiful. If you look on the basket weaving maps now, those weavers in California are still very active. But the Southeast took a lot of hits. And, you know, things didn't last. I'm sure when your family is ripped up and told to go to the other side of the country, how many pretty things are you taking with you if you had a chance to make them anyway? Um, so we don't know, we just think that they weren't available to Miss Gardner and thinking in 1900 to 1904, that's when she was collecting most of those. Her pictures that I showed you on her porch were from 1904. So it's, um, she was doing the best she could to get her hands on those. And this is the last slide of baskets. The um, Alta Capa and Chetamacha are both from Louisiana. And there are similarities with the Choctaw. If you look at the nesting set, okay, this is a triple whammy for me. Um, the biggest one is, you know, five or six inches tall. They nest inside of each other perfectly. They are each double woven. The lids are each double woven. And they have the traditional pattern on the outside from the Chittimachas. And if there are more than two Chittimacha weavers today, it's a miracle. There may be three. Um, and they're within the Darden family. And there is a waiting list. 
for commissioned pieces and you'll be lucky to ever be able to get one or afford one. Um, to me, they're, they're the best southeastern weavers ever. Um, the Alticapa is show, has that Louisiana feel. You feel that little orange uh, and yellow color that comes through on those baskets, but it is a single woven piece. And again, I believe this one is still a mystery to some basket experts. And this just shows you a basic um, grid point format of southeastern made baskets. Checkerboard pattern. It's what we keep, teach kids on over and under, over and under with little paper strips. It's the same concept. But you can go over one, under two. You can change the pattern and rhythm of, of how many um, strips, or splints, that's what we call them, as you're going over and under. And E is uh, what you would see made with the honeysuckle baskets. Now, the book Floating Around is by Native Hands, so yes, you can order from our gift shop if you want one. Um, probably Amazon may still have some, I'm not sure. And then back to the museum. Does anybody have any questions? Um, do you have any thoughts on perhaps uh, influences on, on uh, Native I saw a couple of baskets that could have been made, mm -hmm. just like a gathering basket, mm -hmm. one perhaps an egg basket. Right. I think shapes are very basic, and um, the southeastern tribes. You know, when we've talked about Nagpra and, and sacred things, there really aren't objects or shapes that they feel are really sacred. Um, their materials and where to find them, that's sacred to them. But there are not patterns and things like you would find out in the West. But egg-shaped baskets, everything's traditional. Everything is really made to be functional. Even if it's uh, like the heart-shaped basket that may be our elbow basket made to hang on the wall and hold flowers. Um, they, were, they were interested in traditional lifestyles and, and not ceremonies so much. Yes, ma'am. Okay, um, because I'm not a plant expert, <laughs> don't take me 100%. Um, but the swamp cane is hollow completely on the inside. Can somebody tell me if bamboo is solid at the knots? That's what I've always understood, solid at the knots. So, And it's also bigger and thicker around. Um, and so I would think that swamp cane is just, it was plentiful. You know, in our swampy region, it was plentiful um, at one time. And bamboo was not was not around for them and so there's they're still leaning toward what was plentiful for them what grows naturally and what grows all year long um, if I'm going outside to to do something pine needles are like they were like crazy in my yard so if I'm thinking I got to use what's in my own backyard that's what I'm doing all right one more question time's up but we can keep with a couple of questions is that right yes ma'am let me take hers first It is still a big driver. The Masonite Corporation started in Laurel because there were mount mountains of sawdust. And that's another whole story for Laurel. But Mr. Mason, the inventor, worked for Thomas Edison as an apprentice. He worked in several other companies, married someone whose family was in the timber industry, and that kind of came full circle, and voila, Masonite was invented. And <laughs> But the chicken industry, Sanderson Farms, their home is in Laurel. Um, we have another, uh, uh, GE Aviation is there. Howard Industries is there. We have been, I have to say, Masonite is still in operation, our local plant. But it's had many ups and downs over the years. But it's been like every time there's an oil and gas. We've got four or five oil wells in the city limits. So anytime one industry goes down, another one seems to kind of help fill the gap. And it's, our town is industry driven. And it's kept us functioning and floating and keeping, keeping people at work. Yes. Some, some, like roots. Has there been an analysis of that? Basically, I'm wondering if the saliva has some sort of setting. Well, 
to from what I've seen from the old pieces, the early dyes, the natural dyes, are staying. They're there. It's the writ dye that is the yeah yeah. It fades quickly. It's hard for it to take, and it doesn't take in a nice rich tone like that they were used to using or having. And so, others of you, I'm going to say one quick thing. Um, HGTV Hometown is in our town. So you'll learn a little bit about our town by watching and, um, and, and learn about new people coming in because it's, it's a whole new little community and we're, we're excited about it. But when people say Laurel, well, that'll give you another little inkling of, as to what goes on in Laurel. So.